I'd like to welcome everybody back to the Religion Matters show, uh, produced by the Institute for Religious Tolerance, Peace, and Justice. I know it's been a little while since we've had an episode. Uh, I believe our last episode with, was with uh, Reverend Dr. Jungmei Kenneth Park. And uh, I'm delighted to say that we're back here now with Grace Slick, noted rock musician and uh, uh, lead singer of Jefferson Airplane and Jefferson Starship. Uh, she's had a tremendous uh, solo career as well, and she has an amazing second career as a painter. And we're very grateful to be here to talk with her today about a variety of topics having to do with spirituality and religion. Uh, now, when I first mentioned to some of our associates, and I believe it actually was uh, Eric's sister, um, uh, that we were going to be doing an interview with Grace Slick, uh, the question came up that, well, what does rock and roll have to do with religion and spirituality? And of course, well, uh, our show has always been about interviewing people uh, from different walks of life and uh, different faith traditions about religion and spirituality. And of course, we've done a number of interviews with clergy and scholars and monks of different sorts. But, um, you know, we want to get Grace's viewpoint um, which is, of course, no less important than any of the other, these other people who we've dealt with, various monks and clergy and so forth. Her influence has been felt in America and in the world for decades, and we'd like to talk about where her spirituality fits into her life. So um, I do want to mention that I've known Grace's daughter, uh, China, for a number of years. She's been a close friend of mine for a while. And when China became involved with the Institute as a volunteer, and as an, uh, a member of the advisory council, she talked to her mom about getting involved with the Institute in some way, shape, or form, and her mom has expressed interest in supporting the, the notion of religious tolerance. So, um, so in keeping with our mission, we're here to talk with Grace about her own spirituality as it has functioned in her life and how it has developed and changed. So uh, I want to thank you for being here. I'm delighted. I'm thank a little you. intimidated, uh, so you know, I'm humbled. I'm humbled being in your presence. Well, I'm humbled being in your presence for everything that China says. <laughs> uh, by the way, my daughter's not seven or anything. She's uh, 41 years old. So right, right. this is a, uh, not a, but people tend to think of daughter as, you know, somebody jumping rope. Um, <laughs> yeah, the initial uh, aspect of religion that was, uh, I was introduced to as a child was I was baptized Episcopalian. Uh -huh. My parents didn't go to church. Later on, when I was 20 or something, I said, you know, do you, what do you think about God? Do you believe in God? My father said, no, I'm agnostic, hmm. which means I don't know. And my mother said, oh, yeah, I have my own kind of God, but they never went to church unless somebody got married. So there was no, uh, I wasn't hammered by anything, which I'm very grateful for, because a lot of times people get hammered with something and they forget that it's okay to look around. And so I did that simply because um, we were kind of interested in things other than what we were taught simply because it's a good thing to open your head up mm -hmm. uh, in the 60s to um, study a little bit. I'm, it's a dilettante uh, relationship. But a little, you look around, you look at um, the uh, Buddhists. What are they talking about? What are the Jews talking about? What are the Catholics talking about? What are the Episcopalians talking about? Episcopal, uh, the best I could figure was sort of Catholic light. <laughs> and uh, A lot of people say that. <laughs> the uh, Catholics I had a little problem with for a long time because I don't want to belong to an outfit that has uh, the Middle Ages. Come on, Grace, I'm having a senior moment. The Inquisition. <laughs> yes. Uh, I, it's a little tricky to belong to an outfit with that kind of history. Uh, so I m was annoyed with them for doing that. I thought... What would Jesus say mm -hmm. if he could see what you're doing, you know? And did he talk about you've got to wear certain uh, gold hats with a lot of plumes and incense and all this other business? But the thing about the word God, uh, I notice it really upsets people, which amuses me. It's like swear words. I use a lot of them just to watch people react to a word. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and and feel word, free to use them here. We'll just bleep them out if necessary. And, uh, yeah, <laughs> the word God uh, makes everybody nuts. So I always like to talk about uh, that because it, it, why do you worry about that? You know, as some people call it Allah. Some people call it uh, Yahweh. Mm -hmm. Some people call it well, you, all different kinds of names to the, basically the same thing. 
and uh, why we've had we've killed more people in the name of religion than any other reason except possibly land. Mm -hmm. I don't know. They're probably running neck and neck. Mm -hmm. But why would you kill people when all of the uh, major religions, their initial guys, the hot shots, uh, you know, Muhammad and Jesus and uh, uh, whoever it is from your religion, all the original guys, none of them said it was good to go around kill, killing people, really. Uh, they said, now the word for jihad uh, is, I don't think means go out and kill people, it's, it's work, it's an effort. Uh, jihad is an effort. And I know a lot of people who are Muslim or Islamic who have no interest in going around killing people, you know. There was one rock and roll guy, Cat Stevens, who is now Islamic. And I think that's fine if you identify, somehow your, your being identifies with Judaism or Islam or Catholicism or whatever it is, why should I do anything ugly about that? That's your business. Some people, I don't like Brussels sprouts. Some people do. <laughs> that's fine. Then you eat a lot of them and I won't eat any. Why do you care what I'm doing? It's none of your business, just for starters, you know, and it's none of my business how many Brussels sprouts you eat. As long as you aren't hurting anybody, I don't care. You know, I believe in footstools. Great, you just have a good time with footstools. And I don't know how to promote an open mind. How do you do that? You know, how, how in the world? Because nobody will do it. Your parents won't do it. Your parents want you to be a Methodist. <laughs> Your parents want you to be a Mormon. Your parents told you, and you never broke out of that. You stayed right in there. Why? Why didn't you look around? You know, how you go to uh, a lake, and you look at the trees, and you look at the deer running around, you look at the lake, you get a boat, you maybe uh, go inland, and maybe they have a casino, and you bet a couple dollars. Uh, you know, there's all kinds of things to do, and religion's the same way. Uh, be with them, be with certain people for a while, and see how does that feel to you? Instead of just accepting what a couple of other people did. Now, why wouldn't my parents even baptize me? They didn't go to church. Mm -hmm. What was that about? Was it, it's kind of a social thing, maybe. Mm -hmm. Okay, fine, I don't care. You get a little water on your head and everybody's thinking that it's a good idea and nobody got hurt. That's fine. Were your grandparents religious in that respect? Was it sort of done out of respect for them, maybe? I have no idea mm. because I wasn't, I never did ask my grandmother. Mm. Uh, she was kind of, I think being a screwball jumps generations because I'm <laughs> screwy and she was screwy, but my mother was kind of regular. She mm. wasn't, uh, you know, too out there. She was a singer. Um, when she was very young and she married my father who was an investment banker and I think it was looked down on for an investment banker at the time to be married to a nightclub singer. Sure. It's not right but they both went to the same school University of Washington in Seattle and they both got straight A's and did what they were told and for the most part of their life they did what they were told and their drug was alcohol as was mine my, my favorite was Quaaludes, but they stopped making them uh, 30 years ago, which is kind of too bad. Um, I didn't yell at as many cops when I was uh, high on <laughs> Quaaludes as I did alcohols. I get uh, nasty, so uh, I shouldn't be doing it in the first place. Um, the openness of being able to uh, look around and see how do people behave we had uh, in the band a couple of Jews, a black guy, uh, some Celts, uh, uh, a German, and they all, we all managed to play together. Mm -hmm. uh, the, I think um, one of the guys in the band now has uh, uh, taken up uh, a Christianity in some form. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, another guy is an atheist. Fine. That gets you through the night. I don't care. Mm -hmm. As long as you're being okay with your people, your family, your, go ahead. I cannot for the life of me understand why you'd want to kill somebody over what they believe in. Mm -hmm. I cannot figure it out. 
a lot of the religions I don't understand. They have a lot of goo attached to them. <laughs> um, I'm more interested in spirituality than religion. Religion right. involves a repetition of the same thing over and over again, which I don't do, so I'm not religious per se. Mm -hmm. But spiritual is a whole other thing, and you can be spiritual even if you're an atheist. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as long as you're okay, I don't get it. And how do we, you, I, anybody, promote openness? Leave them alone. Mm -hmm. They want to believe in that bear? Fine. <laughs> and all of the atheists I know were originally Catholics. Mm -hmm. And there's so much... Um, uh, uh, fancy stuff that goes on in the Catholic Church uh, that once th these people grow up to a point where logic and all that stuff kicks in, they get so mad that they become atheists. And I think that's interesting. They say, I'm an atheist. And I said, how are you trained as a kid? Uh, Catholic. I said, you aren't a real atheist. Yeah. You're just annoyed. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. But maybe they are. You yeah. know, I don't. What do I know? Yeah. Well, it's uh, very true. And if I can jump in now, you know, I'm a scholar of religious studies. I do this for a living, and and there's a there's a debate among among scholars where we talk about the question of religion versus spirituality. Now, it's fine pe for people to say, well, I'm not religious, I'm spiritual. That's something that people have begun to say over the last 40 years or so, but from a religious studies point of view, it's still a form of religion. But one thing that I've noted is when people say, oh, I'm not religious, I'm spiritual, it's usually because they're, they're fed up with whatever organized religion they were brought up with. Well, religion also means a repetition of the mm -hmm. same thing. Right. So right. if you don't repeat the same practice over mm -hmm. and over again, then you probably are not, uh, couldn't call yourself religious. Mm because it's a repetition. Mm. Um, that's the only reason I don't call myself, because I don't repeat anything on a regular basis. Mm. Not even prayer. Interesting. Sometimes I'll wander around, I talk to God out loud, and sometimes I don't say anything for a month. Uh, so it's not even that isn't even a repetition. Mm. I don't do any kneeling or uh, uh, butt in the air, things or you know nothing I don't wear any funny stuff um, and I will listen to a bright Catholic priest as fast as I'll listen to any bus I just uh, if you're hell and uh, brimstone I'm probably not gonna be there for long because I that, that seems silly to let uh, any any uh, outfit although I rail on the Catholic Church I just don't want to belong to it is all. Um, I still have met, there's a father that uh, I met here who's just incredible, bright and funny and open and gay. Mm -hmm. And he is openly gay and uh, I like all of that and I like his bright and funny. Bright and funny gets me every time, you know, mm -hmm. but, but I don't care. Uh, father, I wrote a song called Father Bruce which was talking about Lenny Bruce, mm -hmm. because he seemed at the time like he was a minister. Mm -hmm. And he was, because he's making a joke out of things that are hideous. He's talking about Hitler, Adolf Hitler. He said, Adolf, five, Hitler, five letters, F five and five for the marquee, that's much better than Schickel Gruber. <laughs> you, you <know? laughs> and you just go, because no comedians were doing that. Right. Mort, Mort saw a little bit, but Lenny Bruce was just stunning. Mm -hmm. And I thought of him as, uh, I said in the song, he's an on-beat preacher, and he lives at the Swiss Hotel, which, which is where he lived when he was in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't see, he is basically a Jew, but he's not a Jew. He had his own uh, kind of um, congregation, and he's his own kind of preacher, you know. Okay. So, so he's not Catholic? Maybe I misunderstood you at first. So he's not Lenny a Catholic Bruce, priest? No, he's, he's oh, no. from a Jewish family. I thought you were talking about this other priest in the area oh, who's gay. No, he is Catholic. He's definitely right. Catholic. Okay. Uh, but I don't, it, it's the individual. There are some individual people who can try it. And I asked him, why do you like Catholicism? And he said, uh, I'm very um, happy with tradition. Mm -hmm. And some people are. And that's fine. You know, he's happy with tradition. Um, I said, do you have trouble with the uh, 
remarks in the Bible about being gay. And he said, no, there are a lot of remarks in the Bible that, that are uh, bizarre. So he's not going to say, some people say everything in the Bible is true. Right. Well, you can't say that because it contradicts itself. Mm -hmm. So some of it's analogous and some of it's, you know, you just can't Literal say and metaphorical, it. both. Yeah. yeah, or metaphorical. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so you, there's a saying in AA, take what you need and leave the rest. Mm -hmm. And you can also do that with the Bible. China was given a book uh, by the guy she was living with time, who said, read the red. Apparently there was a Bible that has uh, certain things in red. Editions. Red letter yeah. edition. Everything that Jesus is quoted as saying, yeah. they haven't read. Yeah. It's, mm -hmm. And that's going back to something I like, which is the original guys, it's been, uh, all of this big religions have been so mangled by human beings mm -hmm. that you just go, what did the original guys who were really spiritually evolved for whatever reason, uh, I don't know if you're born that way or if God comes down and bats you on the head or whatever <laughs> happens, uh, they all said pretty much the same thing and it was all good stuff. Mm -hmm. So uh, China said, oh, okay, I'll read that. And she read, he said, I just did it because every time I do it, it makes me feel better. Mm -hmm. What a great thing to say. Instead, he's not hammering her with stuff. He's mm -hmm. just saying, try this. Like we used to say, try acid. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. Um, <laughs> But acid is also a spiritual uh, experience, but it's tricky because you have to be in pretty good mental shape, mm. otherwise you'll flip out. We didn't know that because when we took acid, we were all young, employed, living in California, and pretty happy. So none of us really flipped out. Mm. And we didn't realize that you're, if you're living in a slum and your father beats you and you take acid, probably some ugly stuff's going to happen to your being. Uh, not from your father, just your own. So you best, if you have problems like that, take it with a psychiatrist mm -hmm. or psychologist. Mm -hmm. um, and we always had uh, one person who was not high who would follow us around in case anybody thought they could fly. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. And a lot of people do that. And Art Linkletter's daughter jumped out of the window and killed herself. Yeah. And I didn't know that. I was in New York in a hotel uh, getting ready to go to a recording studio, make a solo album at some point on the 70s or something. And uh, Art Linkletter was on somebody's talk show and he said, uh, Grace Slick and Timothy Leary are responsible for my daughter's death. And I whirled around <laughs> to the TV. What the hell is he talking about? And he... I called the radio or the TV station and I couldn't get through but I was going to say is Sandy Seagram whom I went to school with Seagram's gin right I said is Sandy Seagram responsible for people all these thousands of people who die from mm -hmm. alcoholism mm -hmm. or what you know you can't you can't really say that what happens is that although he <laughs> had children's shows Apparently, he wasn't as attentive mm -hmm. to his own daughter's uh, psychological well-being as he could have been. Anyway, but I'd love to hear more about um, <clears throat> how your own spirituality has resonated with AA. You've talked about, about your, your time in 12-step programs, and I don't yeah. know whether the audience knows how spiritually oriented 12-step programs well, the thing, are. The thing that I liked, because even before I went to any AA meetings, the, the Highway Patrol decided that it was good for me to go to <laughs> AA meetings. And they were right. A uh, car is a weapon. Mm -hmm. uh, and I didn't think of it that way at the time, but they're, they're right. It is a weapon. I mean, it's two tons of machinery, and you're driving around uh, loaded to the gills, you know. <clears throat> so I went to the meetings because I was told to. Had to have paper sign and everything by the secretary. And they didn't own any property. Mm -hmm. There were no... Uh, people who are above anybody else, it's all the same, no funny outfits, and I went, okay, that is spiritual. That mm -hmm. is a, you could call a religion because you repeat it. Mm -hmm. So um, it, it was amazing because I love the general spirituality. I don't like having any names. I don't want to be called an anything. I am an alcoholic. Uh, and I am the one who calls myself that. They say in AA, you're the only one who can decide. 
everybody else can point fingers at you your entire life. Mm -hmm. You have to decide that. Uh, so it has no uh, stuff around it. I mean, if you want stuff, that's great. There are movies, there are uh, uh, cabaret shows where people ha are wearing a lot of stuff. <laughs> and there's a lot of stuff going on. You know, and stuff's great. But stuff with spirituality somehow to me is weird. Uh, that the entertainment industry is fine. I live here. I live in L.A. I'm an entertainer. What that, I love it. Uh, I never had any dancing girls or any of that kind of stuff, but maybe if I went into it now, I would. Like Britney Spears, a lot of boys in the background, you know, <laughs> flying, exploding chickens and whatever it is they have. <laughs> and uh, But we didn't have that. The San Francisco bands were just kind of, you just show up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you hope you're not too loaded to get through the set. We took... Acid actually once in Fargo, North Dakota. We didn't mean to. We meant to snort some coke backstage, but it was dark. And our road manager had this plastic thing with all these cubicles in it, and it each had different drugs. Mm -hmm. And the light was such that we mistook the thing with acid in it for the cocaine, mm -hmm. and we thought we were snorting cocaine, which will not really, if you just snort it once, it's not really going to blow your brains out. So we snorted, we thought we were taking some coke, oh boy, this be good. It was acid, so about 15 minutes into the set, we're all, because it's not easy to play on acid. Mm -hmm. it, it is really strange. <laughs> and we used to try and dose each other, the Grateful Dead, and you know, you can't leave your, like, I can't leave my Snapple around if you're playing with the Grateful Dead, because mm -hmm. they're gonna drop acid in there. Uh, but there, it was this arena in North Fargo that the stage was down mm -hmm. rather than being up, and the people were up. So you're looking at all these people <laughs> that are going to ooze down on you or something. You just did. <laughs> <laughs> and at one point, because I love Jack Cassidy's bass playing, he's obviously our bass player, and so I just, I was supposed to be playing piano, I just stopped. <laughs> I have to listen to Jack now. <laughs> you know, so. <laughs> For me, it's not easy playing loaded because I don't know what I'm doing. Sure. Uh, but it, it's, it's a tricky drug. So I'm not saying anything because the kids don't really take acid now. Uh, kids want to be uh, more sedated than, uh, unless you're trying to pass a final and they all take speed and stuff. Mm. But I don't know and have never had because I've been sober for a while now. Uh, I've never had any of the party drugs, mm -hmm. like so ecstasy or I have no idea what they're like, yeah. you know. Yeah. And my husband's 14, my ex-husband's 14 years younger than I am, so mm -hmm. he had PCP. Mm -hmm. And he said, don't ever take that. And I said, okay. He said, I had to run around the block about 48,000 times just because it was, you just have this horrible thing going on. And I thought, well, that doesn't sound like fun. Well, we were talking a little bit about 12-step circles and the spirituality of 12-step yeah, circles. The, yeah, but the... the uh, Alcoholics Anonymous, all the 12-step uh, programs, with the exception of Promises, uh, not, not Promises, what is it, the guy on television comes on, he says, I, we will cure your addiction. And I thought, I haven't oh heard my. that. Wow. Yeah, there's a place <laughs> out here where the, he said, you come in, you're an addict, and you go out cured. And I thought, I'd like to see your specs on that and follow mm -hmm. those people around. Because even the most successful uh, thing, which is Alcoholics Anonymous, about 8% of the people go in, stay sober. Mm. It's not that easy. Mm. Um, so he, <laughs> I don't know, and he's got a book and they advertise on CNN. And I'm surprised CNN doesn't check the um, uh, polls and percentages mm. and whatever people do to find out how successful that is and whether it's bogus. Mm -hmm. you know? But. Plus, in the 12-step philosophy, as I understand it, you're never fully cured. You're just no, in recovery. I am still an addict. Yeah. Uh, I just don't happen to use any, any so-called fun drugs. Um, I have to use, uh, what do I have for diabetes and for mm. something else? I don't know. Mm. And 8,000 different vitamins. <laughs> I assume they're doing some good. What do I know? I'm still here. I'm yeah. 73. You're I'm above ground, as they say. I'm a happy guy. <laughs> so apparently something's working. Yeah. You know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Um, but AA is the only 
uh, spiritual outfit that I thought, uh-huh, even because I didn't stop drinking. Mm. But I kept going to meetings because I liked it as a spiritual mm. program. I didn't feel like stopping drinking. I liked mm. liquor, or did at the time. And uh, so I'd go, and the, the, some, of, some of the people say, oh, Grace, you're going to die if you don't say, so I'd go out, get drunk, come back in, raise my hand. I'm a newcomer. <laughs> and at one point, I was a coffee maker. And it was set up so that they couldn't smell my breath. And I was having coffee, but it had brandy in it. Theirs was all regular. <laughs> I just did, didn't care. And, uh, but I liked it, whether I was drinking or not. I liked the idea of it, the, how it works, um, the, the way people are, the fact that there are no hot shots. Because you're just as likely, after 25 years of sobriety, to go out and get screwed up. Mm -hmm as you are after one week. So you, you can't think of yourself as an, a, a hot shot. Right. It's too tricky a situation, mm. addiction, because uh, for some people, um, every bone in their body is saying, I need cocaine or I need whatever it is. And uh, most people don't get past the th or think about the thing of, you know what's going to happen in the long run. Yeah, I know what's going to happen, but I don't, it doesn't, it hasn't sunk all the way in. And I'm one of the ones who knows that because I've been in and out of that outfit since 1978. Mm -hmm. And I kept going in and out and in. I was sober all during the 80s. Then I got bored with it <laughs> because somehow I just thought, I'm not going to die of alcoholism. Well, now that probably turns out to be true, mm -hmm. but not because I'm so marvelous, just because I'm so old and sober, I probably <laughs> won't die of alcoholism. <laughs> but you don't know that. I don't know that for sure either. Mm -hmm. But basically what we're doing when we get old is we're decaying. Mm -hmm. We're rotting like you see flowers when they start mm -hmm. getting rotten. Right. That's why you don't send anybody old flowers, <laughs> unless you're annoyed with them, <laughs> you know. And that's why you don't see any uh, um, people my age in bikinis in some kind of a magazine, because it would make you throw up. Uh, you know, it's really, and it's kind of uh, hard on the, the ego, mm -hmm. on the pride, is I will get out of the shower and catch a look in the mirror and go, oh, <laughs> <laughs> But that's the way it is. What mm -hmm. are you going to do? Mm -hmm. you may as well be happy and ugly at the same time. <laughs> A lot of young people are ugly and happy. Hey, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Are you, are you guys setting up a schools or areas in, I was thinking of all over the world, right. to teach this openness mm -hmm. uh, uh, to people, but teach it at a very young age, because mm -hmm. we are so... Uh, imprinted mm -hmm. uh, between the ages of zero and five right, right. is stunning imprints. Right. I don't even remember being zero to five. I, I remember being on a train when I was three coming from mm -hmm. Chicago to Los Angeles with my aunt. I remember that. And I didn't even know what to say then. Aunt, aunt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a different regional dialect. Yeah. yeah. So uh, uh, I don't even remember stuff. But it's in there, yeah. and it's a real powerful imprint. So to teach very young kids in a happy way all different kinds of stuff. Here's a menorah. What is that? Oh, that's pretty. And what we do is, and here is a rug, and we all bow because we went, and here, you know, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. To very young people, would their parents allow it? We could hope. I, you, you get people who are willing to have their children in programs like that, and you, you make it more common so that maybe their next door neighbor says, oh yeah, they, the Smiths, they go to that thing where they go to different houses of worship and yeah. they take their kids with them, and they're not forced to pray that way, but they, they have a better understanding of what their Buddhist neighbors are, yeah. or their Muslim neighbors are like, and they realize, oh, they're not trying to kill us. Mm -hmm. they're, they're doctors, lawyers, and Indian chiefs just like the rest of us, and, yeah. and, and I guess they're okay, and they're Americans, and they're here to bring up their families in a safe environment, and that's I fine. I didn't know till just recently that the six, and they do pronounce it that way, mm -hmm. I thought it was Sikh, but yes. it's Sikh, uh, were the biggest uh, uh, segment of a religious group 
they're bigger than than uh, Hindu. They're bigger than. Well, I don't know about that. They're, somebody they're, said that on yeah, TV. I don't know incorrect. CNN or. There are about 20 million Sikhs worldwide, if I remember correctly, and okay. there, are, of course, are probably about a billion a billion um, Hindus. Yeah. But they're they're quite large. You know, maybe what they were saying was that they're the largest of the smaller groups because there are more Sikhs okay. in the world than Jews. Okay. That's the interesting wow. thing. There are about 14, 13, 14 million and we Jews don't worldwide hear today. About their stuff at all. Them. Yeah. You know, except for this last mess yes. that happened. Somebody goes in and. Because they wear certain things on their head. Yeah, the turban and so forth. What is the matter with you? Are you mm. kidding me? The guy's got a towel on his head. He likes it <laughs> fine. I wear denim. You don't like it? Don't mess with me. I simply have denim on. You don't like denim? Then don't wear it. Yeah. You don't like towels on your head? Don't wear them. Okay. One of our board members is, is a Sikh. He's uh, is, uh, Dr. Arinder Chada. China's met him. And we did an episode with him early on in, in, this, in these podcasts. Yeah. And so if you ever get a chance, you feel like it, tune in and see Dr. Arinder Chada's episode. And he talks about being a Sikh in America. He's, he's from India originally. He came here. He spent time in New York during 9-11. And of course, a lot of people just assumed he was Muslim. Right. And you know, whether you have we're, anything we're against so Muslims or not, he said, ah, there's a Muslim. And so there was a certain amount of prejudice against him. Yeah. Definitely. Well, China is very good about uh, races, religions, all that kind of stuff. She uh, mm. somehow picked up, and I'm not sure where, because it's not necessarily her mother and father. Mm. It's um, maybe it's rock and roll, I know, because mm. that's real broad. Right. And we sort of all like each other, regardless of what we have on or what you know <laughs> anything. So maybe it's rock and roll. I don't know. Right. Uh, but she's very open, and I just love that. Mm -hmm. And um, people ask about Obama. Uh, you figure if you're a black person, you might vote for Obama partially because he's black. Mm -hmm. And I voted for him partially because he's black. Mm -hmm. He's also left wing. I'm a uh, Democratic Socialist. I guess there's one uh, senator from Vermont or something who is Democratic Socialist. Mm -hmm. But uh, people say, oh, he's a socialist. How can you? And I said, because I like that. <laughs> I like governments that take care of their people first and then worry about how many tanks they've got later. <laughs> you know, spend the money on the people first and worry about all the, uh, the childish stuff later. Um, I shouldn't say that, you know, this, but... For a lot of people I know, the Second World War was the last one that mm -hmm. needed to be fought. Right. Right. And the rest of it is us interfering in other people's Panama and, and, uh, and uh, it, it, almost anywhere in the Middle East. And you mm -hmm. just think, why do we have to do that? We've known how to run cars on bananas since <laughs> the 50s. And even Eisenhower, who's a Republican, said, beware of the military-industrial complex. complex. Absolutely. That's and right. he, the Republicans said, my parents were Republican. They weren't as quite as, as a kind of um, inattentive, let me put it that way, as they are now. Because if you watch Bill Maher or you watch any of these people, they'll bring up, uh, you know, Stephen Colbert. The, I, I pay more attention to the comedians, what they're saying, uh, than I do Wolf Blitzer. I listen to Wolf Blitzer, but I will probably... Uh, agree with the comedians. Um, my God, they're a bunch of Jews from California. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, the comedians usually have a really good take on it, plus they're entertaining. Mm -hmm. How best to get information across 